Hello and welcome to tonight's episode of Double Down on the Irish Inquiry. I'm your host, John Caulfield, and I'm delighted to be joined here tonight by primary school teacher Barra de Rochda. Barra is a member of the Irish Education Alliance and he's been a vocal advocate for the preservation of child welfare, I suppose amidst the kind of mass propaganda and neuro-linguistic programming in these very kind of precarious times in which we find ourselves in. Um, I first came to the attention of Barra when I think it was prior to Christmas, there was a rally on O'Connell Street and I heard Barra making reference to The, Mur the Murder Machine by Padraig Pierce, which was a series of writings about the education system within Ireland and how appropriate it was even more than 100 years on, how it still resonated. So I suppose, Barra, in terms of just kind of you know, obviously this will be a conversation which will delve into all the kind of underlying structures of the modern education system and how it's quite essentially unfit for purpose. I might just give the audience a couple of the quotes that I actually found from uh, The Murder Machine, maybe just to pretext the story and that kind of maybe give it an introduction as to, you know, where it is that you're coming from. You have it there. Is that it in your hand? This is the Bible. It's all in there. Take it away, John. Absolutely. You'll know everything I'm talking about. So, so just some of the quotes that I found that really resonated. So, Modern education systems are elaborate pieces of machinery devised by highly salaried officials for the purpose of turning out citizens according to certain approved patterns. The modern school is a state controlled institution designed to produce workers for the state. Education should foster, this education is meant to repress. Education should inspire, this education is meant to tame. Education should harden, this education is meant to enervate. The English are too wise a people to attempt to educate the Irish in any worthy sense. What ed education Ireland needed was less a reconstruction of its machinery than a regeneration of its spirit. The machinery has doubtless its defects, but what is chiefly wrong with it is that it is merely machinery, a lifeless thing without a soul. So Barra, 100 and what, 109 years on, um, not much has changed seemingly in something we've really learned over the course of the last two years. Well, thanks, John. You took all my opening quotes there, but uh, <laughs> fair enough. Um, yeah, I was going to read out the quote you read there. This is a, um, a plaque I have up in the house. I'm trying to get on camera there. I got it made up in a piece of slate. It's the quote you read there about the education, um, about this education, our education should foster. This education is meant to repress and so forth. Um, and it's something that I found years and years ago from reading The Murder Machine, and I've, I got it made up and put on the wall there. It's like a reminder to me all of the time about um, our education system and my obligation, I suppose, um, as a teacher. Um, so, yeah, you took half of my quotes there. So this should be a sort of <laughs> short interview, certainly. Um, <clears throat> no, I agree. Look. I think your, that that quote that I have on that slate there should almost be like the rubric for tonight's discussion, you know, and started off with that. And we we'll see, let's base our, let's judge our education system based on what um, um, Pierce quoted there, the murder machine. You're right, 1912, I think it was written. So this year would be 110 years. And when, when you think about that, 110 years, I mean, so far ahead of his time. Now, obviously, he was talking about the English education system in Ireland at the time, but the, the, the English are, are, are gone from 26 counties and it's we, we still have the same problem nothing has changed we're still it's just we the, the enemy has changed essentially uh, if you if you want to look at it that way I don't mean to be sound too militant about it but that's all that's changed nothing else has has actually changed I mean education um you know, has always come about, it came about essentially to address the industrialists, um, you know, to meet the needs of industrialists. Um, I suppose, we're, we're, and I've said this before at, at, at um, rallies and, and, and marches, that we're, we're churning out little minions, and that's the word I use, we're churning out little minions solely for the benefit of, of economies. And that piece you wrote out there at the start, or you read out just before the, um, the, the quote there, modern education systems are a lab of piece, pieces of machinery. And uh, I'm not sure if you mentioned this part, but it says we speak of the efficiency, uh, the cheapness, the up-to-dateness uh, of, an, of an education system. This is Pierce, by the way. He says, just as we speak of the, the efficiency, cheapness, up-to-dateness of a system of manufacturing coal and gas. And uh, he's saying this 110 years ago, and it's exactly what we have now. Uh, today nothing 
has changed so far. In fact, it's going to get worse. And during the course of this this uh, chat, John, I'm sure we, we can elaborate a little bit further on it. Just to give you another little quick there, he mentioned, Pierce mentions the word foster. Um, the old Irish word for teacher was Atche, A-I-T-E, Atche. And the word for pupil was, so Atche actually was the word for, it actually directly translated as um, fosterer. So then you had pupil was Dalta, which we still use today. So it was like a, a foster child, essentially. And then the system was called Achicus, which was essentially fosterage. And I know Pierce coined that question. I think it's in the murder machine as well. He asks, um, and is it not the precise aim of education to foster? Um, and certainly it is, but certainly it, it doesn't appear to be happening at the moment. No, Atcha, by the way, Atcha, by the way, turned into the word Ija, it's the old Irish words. So actually became Ija, O-I-D, which is the Irish word for teacher. You, you know, your pre vija your your prime teacher or main teacher, um, and Atticus then became Educus, you know, so education, you know, and Ryan Educus, the Department of Education. So it's 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 been there. It's part of our history, but it was it, it was fostering. It's all about fostering. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you're actually teaching me a bit of Osquelga there, Barrow, which is something that I know I'm sorely lacking in. And we might touch upon that even, you know, the absence, I suppose, of pride of place of our own national language, which is very unique. And, the, you know, in terms of how it's actually taught in the skill set, it might be, you know, something quite good. Obviously, your name is Barry de Rocha, presumably the English translation. Is that Barry Roach? Is that the... Is is that... Man, there's plenty of the Roaches down, well, Roaches down your part of the world, that's for sure. There is, there is a I few, but... You know, and it's obviously something, you know, we're obviously, if you're looking at it from a broad, you know, perspective, that there, there's an absence of national pride, I suppose, that, you know, there, we're living in quite a heavily demoralised kind of population at the moment. And, you know, if you even trace back our history, back to Arthur Griffith and the Gaelic movement, a big part of it was reinstigating the love of and a spoken word of the Irish language. And yet, you know, despite the fact that I know primary school teachers in Ireland are obviously you know, they're, they're trained as to how to teach Irish and stuff, but there's something sorely lacking in terms of actually, you know, I'll go back to that word that you utilised, fostering, fostering an actual love of language, a love of our own culture. It's it, it's seemingly a big problem that's, you know, it's one. I suppose it's one of many problems that we're actually facing in the current school system and education system. Yeah, well, you can employ the, excuse me, the, 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 the problems behind learning the Irish language to a lot of subjects. Um, Children leave school like not wanting to learn, sick of education. So it's not just Irish that has suffered. It's it's they've taken away the love and the curiosity of learning and education. But certainly with Irish, it has to be addressed. It's gotten to the point now where I don't understand why children are leaving school. Or, or, or I think it's quite an easy fix. I do. I think you can make every school in the country starting next September a Gael school. And when I say Gael school, it doesn't necessarily mean have to fall under the auspices or the ethos of a Gael school. But Patrick Pierce's school, say, for example, everyone thinks it was a Gael school. It wasn't. He respected bilingualism, okay? So it would have been 50% Irish, 50% English. Why in God's name can that not happen now today in our schools? Teachers have a, have a, have a, have a standard of Irish that's, that they're well able to speak. Uh, Irish some better than others, that's fine. I, I Perhaps it comes a lot from, I mean, I'm not fluent in Irish, but I try and use it as much as I can. My children go to the to the, the local Gael school here where I live um, because it, it, it's so important to me. Culture is just, is every, everything. Um, I mean, when it comes to education, Pierce even himself says nationality is of prime importance. So everything has to come from that um, and originate from that pride in, in your your language, your culture, as you mentioned, the Gaelic League that was set up by, by Griffith at all, uh, comes from there. So we could have a fluent, pop a fluent uh, population within one or two generations if the will was there. I don't believe the will is there. And it's as simple as that. And I, I really believe that now more and more because what's gone on in the uh, last two years, there, there certainly is, a, 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 I believe, because we're talking global all the time, and we're probably going to mention that word lots tonight, global, global, global. What, 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 what uses are for Irish in a, in a global context? So it is, I think we're essentially being deculturalized, deculturalized um, not just the Irish, but certainly because our language isn't spoken as strongly as, in other, as other countries' languages. Um, it's going to be easier to deculturalize us, certainly, language-wise. Um, I... I, I I'm at a loss as to how 
the, the government in some way all these departments all, all these gaelic organizations or uh, organizations that that deal with the irish language can't come up with a proper education system and all it is is talking to children in irish every day simple as that using the language every single day of course we use it you know crooks for go to uh, the game up for loan grant it's not enough it should be all of the time all of the time and it's no use if it happens in one classroom and not in another it needs to start from baby infants all the way up you know what i mean and it's just a lack of will i believe and not necessarily from teachers but just from them that the, the, the powers that be so to speak um but certainly you're right about our our, our culture um john it, it has been attacked in a lot of ways i mean you look at our at our history i mentioned there how pierce mentioned how important our history is to us in, in our education system that it's a, a platform or a foundation to, to everything that goes on um, above it you look at our history books and um, they're written by academics or they're written by those who won or who gained something from 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 history um, our true history to me is in our poems our songs our stories our music you know mm. the, the, the history of the, of, you know the true history of the people that's where our history comes from. And I, sorry, I know I'm going to keep mentioning Pierce all through the night. Um, no, that's... No, yeah, that's fine. I'll also mention another gentleman with some of your listeners might be familiar with. His name is Ken Robinson, and I'll come across him as well. And the reason why I'm going to mention the two of them is because one man was saying something 110 years ago, the other man was saying in the last few years, and they're still remarkably, they're remarkably similar. Um, but Pierce was said also that our, our hero stories, so our great stories like of Ku Cullen and Fionn and the Fiend and all of them, all that, are, you know, great stories of, of our history. He said they'll, they'll mean more for boys and girls than all the algebra in all of the books. It'll mean more to them. And we're, I'm not, we're not nobody, including I'm sure Pearson himself. We're not trying to diss maths and languages and things. It's a, a, and, you know, the hierarchy of, of the subjects that are evident at the moment. But it's everything should be based on, on pride our cultural pride and i think if you proud little boys and girls coming into school listening to their history you will give them that it'll just light that little spark and that curiosity and willing to know more and mm. again curiosity is is something that is extremely important as well when it comes to education might be able to jump onto that as well in a minute we should be able to i, I try as much as possible and i'm not the perfect teacher by any means well, I try and revolve everything I teach around history. So I could start with a song, song of our history. Songs have words in it, you know. So it, you can play word games with the words that are in the song. You can do nouns, adjectives. You can do whatever. There's work there that can be taken on. There's learning in, in all of this. Poetry can stem from it. Art can stem from this particular um, um, moment in history or story in, in history. So it, to me, it's a great platform in which to begin learning. Um, and it does grab the children's attention because what I've found, teaching classes down through the years, get them in there with their history and try and get that pride in them and tell them something that happened that they didn't really know about in their country and show that, you know, we're a bloody good bunch in this country with a proud history who fought and fought and fought um, for where we are today. Well, we won't mention that we've, we've lost a lot of that fighting spirit, but then anyway, we won't go into that now. That's another night's discussion. Um, but you'll see then that spark of interest then in children mm. want to learn more. It's, and it, it's so important. We, we now have a culture, I believe, of standardization. You know, we're standardizing yeah. it for children. And, you know, speaking of history, Barry, I think it's a, you know, obviously you're trying to foster the mo a love of nation, a love of culture, a love of community, all these values, which... I suppose people who are quote unquote within the truth movement per se are trying to these trying to preserve, you know, as mm -hmm. like, you know, without getting too political, the globalists have a, you know, a very keen eye on trying to destroy that, you know, homogen trying to make everything homogenized. And, you know, I find it interesting because a lot of people are finding that all of the learnings they found primarily through the education system. Now I'm not chastising yourself as a teacher or any individual teachers who are fighting back, but that, 
you know, history is hearsay. It is an ideological subject. And we are learning that a lot of the history seemingly that has been taught to us is very much with, a, you know, kind of globalist tinted glasses, you know, in, re regarding to the curriculum that they're kind of deliberately tailored and refined almost to kind of insidiously suited narrative of the globalists. Um, like, would it be fair to suggest that, like, you know, children are not in any way taught to question where it is that we come from or what it is that has actually come before us in their own independent, with their own in independent critical thought? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I wouldn't say they're taught not to think that way. It's, um, but certainly the, the, the system yeah. or the, the, the curriculum doesn't provide for a platform for them to be able to do it. No, it, it's not in there in the curriculum. So it, it certainly is going to be left to individual teacher autonomy uh, to do that. And our so, teachers, uh, sorry, for, our, our teachers actually, like, are they, you know, encouraged to actually sway somewhat for the curriculum if some piece of their research or their, you know, like you're obviously a history buff, if there's something you found which doesn't quite align to what's specifically on the curriculum, like is that encouraged or discouraged by the quote unquote the system? Um, put it this way, John, I do my own thing when I'm in school and I don't mean that to come across brazen or I do my own thing. I, I teach children what I feel they need to know. A lot of the curriculum has stuff in there that that should be there, um, but there's a lot of rubbish in there that needs to be tossed out. Um, it needs to be condensed. Uh, the curriculum, uh, certainly. But I will do. I will teach children history that I believe they should uh, learn about. It might not be on that particular. So if I have two or four class, there might be something in fifth and sixth class. In the curriculum of history that I'll say to myself, well, I'm going to teach them this because I'll be honest with you. I don't fully trust that it will be taught to them in fifth and sixth class. They might teach them about World War One and World War Two, and that's great. That's wonderful. I mean, that's very important as well. It's part of the of world history, but it's not any more important than Irish history. And I find a lot of teachers tend to look for World War One and World War Two before 1916 or the 1798 rebellion or the War of Independence and the likes. So I've given myself, put it this way, I've given myself autonomy um, to teach what I feel children um need to know about um people might say well it's not for you to decide well i don't believe it's for the government to decide either um schools should definitely be given autonomy about what they teach and what they uh, what they learn children themselves need to have autonomy in what they learn and ken robertson um who's a marvelous wonderful education um educational uh, speaker you, you look if you, if you go onto youtube look up um, ken robertson ted talks He's marvellous. Just listen to him. And he fully believes in that as well, that schools need have their own autonomy to decide on what they'd like to teach. Of course, within certain parameters, like we're not looking just to go gung-ho either, John, um, and children to have a choice in what they learn. I, mean, I, I, suppose, I, suppose, I suppose, Barry, like, you know, a fair question is, you know, and like with regarding the individuality of children like mm -hmm. does the education system like does it sufficiently encourage individualism and does it really stimulate the creativity of the learner because i know there's even various different learning styles like there's audio there's visual there's kinesthetic like is it like do you know is it fit for purpose in terms of catering obviously there's individual teachers can do as much as they possibly can under their own accord but from a you know a system analyzing the system it seems to be it's you know, it's it, it's very much lacking in that regard. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, if you look at the at the curriculum itself, and uh, the, it, it's the nineteen ninety nine curriculum, it took over nineteen seventy one curriculum, and it was all much more about exploratory learning and uh, um, you know children starting from their own learning points and where wherever they are. Um, but a lot of it, like a, much of education or much of anything, really, is just full of buzzwords. There's a lot of buzzwords there. We've ticked the box there. That's great. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it sounds lovely, but it doesn't actually manifest in the classrooms. Um, you look at school books. I mean, if I'd me why I throw them all out, it's you, 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 it, they're dictating in a lot of schools. I'm not saying every school and not even every teacher. Um, they're dictating what's been taught to children. What about what I want to teach the children? And most importantly, what about the, what the children want to learn? And what if it's not in that book? We go just go ahead and do it anyway. So um, everything should stem from you know individuality. Like Ken Robertson would have mentioned that the three most important things about um, what what education should be based on. He, like he said, number one is individuality, as you just mentioned, John. Um, and 
you know, what, what do we see a lot of the time in classrooms? Children in roles all doing the same thing, all quiet. Um, uniformity. All, uniformity. Yeah, uniformity, it's uniformity, yeah, uniformity, uniforms they wear. Um, I mean, uni, one form, one form we all come in. Um, and, you know, doing the same page, working on the same thing, all quiet. Classrooms are meant to be noisy. And, you know, the first thing I tell student teachers when they come in to me is don't be worrying about a bit of, of noise in the classroom. If it's, if it's noisy for the right reason, in other words, if they're all talking to each other and learning and helping each other, that's great. Don't have children quiet sitting behind the desks being quiet. I mean, you have to, and you can't treat every child the same. They all have different interests, okay? And they have different strengths as well. And as much as possible, now it's easier said than done, John, don't get me wrong, but mm. if you have the will and the desire, that's something, and you're starting and you are going to help. And you could spark a little fire into some of them to, to look towards something that they found really interesting that they didn't know their interest in the past but individuality is so important you, I mean you think of okay a child with ADHD say for example I mean how in God's name are they going to sit there nice and calm like everyone else now in fairness most teachers nowadays can accept that but still some I mean I have no problem with a child with ADHD walking around my classroom getting up out of their place walking around I don't care okay as long as they're not disturbing anyone else I'm okay with that. I don't. I, I let children lie down on the floor underneath their desk and read books. If that makes them comfortable and they're quiet and they're reading there, that's fine. But some teachers can't handle that. But that's addressing the individuality. Do, do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. you, you might you might have come across another, another thing I'd, I'd recommend to people on YouTube, and a lot of you might have seen it. It's called Be a Mr. Jensen. Just type that in, Be a Mr. Jensen. It's about a, a child who was sent to the uh, principal. Um, and it's a true story. You sent to the principal, and he, because he was always fidgeting, couldn't stay easy, always tapping things and shaking his legs and banging and, and the whole lot. Sent to the principal, the teachers couldn't handle him, and the teacher brought the principal brought him in, opened his drawer, took out a set of drumsticks, and gave them to the child, and that child went on to become an international drummer, a world-renowned international drummer. So. Ken Robinson tells a story of a, of a little girl quite similar. She couldn't stay easy as well. And some people, they thought there was something wrong with her, maybe uh, psychologically. So they're bringing her to um, psychologists and the whole lot. And the mother brings her to a psychologist, brings her, um, that the psychologist says to her, go clean her there for a second. You wait there, a good girl, walking out of the room. And he says, I'm going to put on a bit of music. Watch this. You know, the child starts dancing and she turned out to be an international ballerina and to run her own world-renowned ballerina school, okay? That's individuality. It's treating treating every children individually and allow them to find out where their strengths lie in and their interests lie in. Another thing is curiosity. Mm. Now, I just after completing a postgraduate diploma in school leadership through um, University of Limerick, and uh, it was a very good course. I really enjoyed it. There was parts I challenged. Uh, you know, every week I did challenge some things which I didn't get into because there was a global element to it. No, I couldn't be quiet. I couldn't stay quiet. Um, but one of the lecturers even mentioned that, you know, little infants, junior infants will come into, uh, yeah, come into school full of enthusiasm and curiosity and and they leave school, as I mentioned at the start of this conversation, just hating learning, hating education, can't wait to get out of school. So, I mean, what the hell are we doing there? So instead of a culture of, of, of curiosity, we now sort of have a culture of compliance. Now, I don't want to be too hard either because I know a lot of teachers really are some wonderful wonderful teachers and i've worked with some of them in the past and they're marvelous and they don't i'm not going to say conform to the system they don't they you know they're quite autonomous let's say um you know we children are, are being told what to learn and what to see you might know that lovely quote about education what is it again the best teachers are those who show children where to look not what to see and that's exactly where where, where we should be coming from I mean, how many children aren't you given a choice about what they learn, what they want to learn about? Absolutely. And that, how many know, teachers go into a classroom and say, right, here's a piece of paper, write down there what you'd like to learn this year. Now, I'm sure there's lots of listening to this who are teachers who actually do do that. Um, I do it. I do it every term. Um, I haven't always done it, John. I'm not going to, again, going to proclaim to be Mr. Wonderful by any means. It's just over the last four or five years, maybe, maybe a bit longer, I've said, Jesus, you know, I could see what education was doing to children. And I keep that list and I try and 
touch on that as much as possible and give them projects to do on these things and go and find and send them in the right direction if they want to find information on these things. And they enjoy school a little bit more. The first thing, if, if, if uh, new teachers might say to me, um, you know, any advice on blah, 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 blah. And my first bit of advice is get children to like school as much as possible. All right. Not everything is going to be wonderful about school, but we can make it a lot more enjoyable for them. And to me, that's starting from where, what their interests and building from their interests and what they want. And we might mention homeschooling later on. That was, I spoke to some people from homeschooling. I won't go into too much depth, but I mean, that's a huge part of the lack of choice, whether, you know, where they took their, 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 their children out. And then we've got creativity, John. Sorry, can I go on a bit? Yeah, we're going. You know, I did just creativity. Um, Ken Robinson again that wonderful education again I encourage people to look at his TED Talks um, I mean he was saying he quotes Picasso he says Picasso said we're all born artists and that you know the problem with always remaining artists in, in, as we grow up um, and he also said that I think it was he might have said as well we get educated out of creativity mm. um, and you know I was guilty of this for years. We'd be shown them what art to do, right? We're going to do this today, and this you have to do. No, that's paint that that way. That that, that should be that color, you know. And you soon learn. Oh, this is rubbish. Let them do what the hell. They and that goes all the way, that goes all the way to third level, Barra. Just in terms yeah. of role, role regurgitated learning, which yeah. has absolutely no bearing on the real world whatsoever. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. You know, there's a lot more autonomy in primary school for that sort of little bit more ex exploration. I'm not a primary or not a secondary teacher, but I don't need to be to know. How the system works because i went through it and it is one of as you say regurgitating and the sole aim now i know they might have introduced the junior cycle the new junior cycle they're going to do something similar with the new leave insert cycle and be a little bit more you know hands-on it can do this and that but essentially it's still going to be to culminate in the leaving certificate and points you're going to be given a grade or points that, that determines what you're going to do in college now Okay, I know there's a roundabout way of getting to the get what you do. I, I didn't start teaching till I was 30 because the education system didn't serve me. I, I mean, I didn't get the points I wanted to be a teacher. Well, I didn't want to be a teacher. I didn't even really start at 16 years of age, but I wouldn't have got the points anyway, that's for sure. But and I, I couldn't wait to get out of school either. I just, I was forced to learn stuff off by heart and I'm useless at that. I really am. I'm, I'm, it's an awful weakness of mine. I can't learn things out by heart. Mm. Um, so we haven't failed in that way. And um, but certainly individuality, curiosity, creativity. I mean that you look at the hierarchy of subjects, even um, John. It's always the, and it's just the same across the world. It, it starts with you know it's maths and languages, then the sort of humanities, maybe like history and geography, and then what do you have at the bottom of the ladder? You have the arts. So you have music. You have, you know, creative art, art in itself. You've, uh, um, you know, physical education even. And if you even look at the breakdown of the uh, our our curriculum and the time allocated each subject, it's reflected in that mm. hierarchy. And and one of the best education systems in the world, which regularly performs um, at the top at the you know the top end of the um, international assessment uh, tables, is Finland, because they give equal weighting to every single subject okay so if you do two, uh, if you do four hours a week of you know in other words you'll be doing the same amount of hours a week in art as you will do in maths and they're performing and hitting the top of these league tables frequently yeah I, I suppose you know you mentioned their kind of creativity and individualism barrow which are obviously you know very paramount to what education ought to be and <clears throat> excuse me i suppose one of the things which I suppose everybody pretty much uh, who is kind of, you know, so-called going against the narrative is recognising is that the academic and the education system is not cultivating independent critical thought. And I suppose that starts from a very young age, like from your own personal perspective within being a primary school teacher, like what would be the key barriers preventing the cultivation of genuinely independent critical thinkers? Because to the best of my knowledge and, you know, from my understanding, we will certainly wouldn't be in the situation <laughs> as a nation now if that was the case. Yeah. Well, you've almost nearly answered your own question it's 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 been happening for a long long time a lot of people use the word indoctrination when it comes to education yeah um i don't throw the, i don't use that word 
much myself now, to be honest with you, but I have to step back as well, step out of the teaching body and, and look at it as been indoctrination. When you, we look at what's been going on the last two years, but we've got to remember these evil people who are planning what's going on in the world at the moment have been at this for for hundreds of years. We think this is all new, has only happened in the last two years or 10 years or 50 years or even 100 years. It's going on hundreds of years. So this, yes, certainly has been... Um, what they're looking for... We've all, countries always want an obedient society. It's as simple as that. They don't want the sovereign people who question things. They're always looking for obedience so of course why would they develop a curriculum that gets people to be critical thinkers um so if, if i can only talk about it now well and again i don't want to be harsh on a lot of my colleagues but sure hey i'm on I'm, I'm here i mean you see how many teachers have fallen for this covid nonsense and the covid narrative okay who haven't got the critical skills to see through the pure and utter nonsense and it doesn't take a genius to see through it there's simple figures there's simple statistics out there um, and not hidden on the dark web anywhere they're on official government websites you can work out for yourself that this is a joke is nonsense and there is something very sinister behind it but most teachers haven't seen that and they're educating their children now so if we're looking to develop critical thinking skills in teachers, and I think I might have mentioned this in the middle of O'Connell Street one day, how can we when our teachers don't have critical thinking skills? Mm. And they're victims of our education system as well. They all went through the education system. How do a lot of us come out with critical thinking skills? I don't know. I don't know where I got mine from. Um, I don't know where you got yours from. I don't know where my colleagues in the Irish Education Alliance... Well, uh, I, there, I suppose... There. What I find, Barry, you know, maybe I don't know if it's similar enough to yourself, but like I found that I actually, when I kind of woke up as such, for want of a better term, I had to deprogram myself from a lot of the indoctrination that I would have learned via the system. And I believe most education these days, because the system is so not fit for purpose, it's actually self-education. Exactly. No, I'd agree to 100%. And the onus is on you to actually go out and educate yourself. I do believe that. Um Certainly as a teacher, I've always said, you stop being a teacher as soon as you stop learning. And I, and I try and instill that in children's heads. Like, don't think just when you're finished school, you stop learning. You learn. But you learn about stuff that you want to learn. Buy a book and something that interests you. Um, and that's so important. And, of course, turn off the television because, you know, again, you know, I'm, never, I'm not going to complain to I've always been awake. Certainly haven't. Um, but look, and I'm trying to pass that message over to children now in school, just to question everything, question everything, question everything. Don't believe everything you say. I can't give my opinion. And I said this, you know, when I was speaking to Ashton a lot, and I can't tell the children, give my opinion on what I think of everything that's going on. I don't want to do that. But I do want to facilitate discussion and get them to ask questions. Or I might pose a question to get them to think differently for a second. So you can sort of guide them down the right channels. But, you know, children are actually naturally very... Are, are, I think are quite good critical thinkers at a young age anyway, up to about the age of 10, 11 anyway. And I just think that the further they go up the education system, that's just lost. They lose heart, I think. And they just they just do stuff for the sake of having to do it. They were told to do it and they just stop thinking. That's they, become, they become exposed to more and more kind of, you know, social engineering very yeah. much so. You know, to yeah. be you know, fulfilling a purpose that the state and the industrialists and the globalists that they want you to fulfill. And it's not your true authentic purpose. It's not, it's a, it's really is a crushing of the soul, really. Mm. And so can you blame them, John? I mean, no. you know, so what are we doing? I mean, we need a radical overhaul. Like, for example, at the moment, the, there is talk of a new curriculum. Well, actually, they have. They have the actual a draft up at the moment. So, um. Can parents get involved? Can teachers get involved? Yes, they can, but they don't advertise it now very well, do they? Um, February, the end of this month, I think, is when the um, applications for you know for input into the, the the draft framework of the new curriculum is up. And so, I'd encourage any parents here or teachers or anyone here. You don't have to be a parent. You can be you know somebody's interested in education and the education of children. You can go onto the NCCA website. NCCA and you'll find it just click on somewhere there be the new curriculum uh, consultation whatever I'm sure you'll find a tab that will bring you there and there's lots of actually focus groups you can get involved in online meetings uh, submit um, question or surveys uh, answer questionnaires online and submit them 
and give their opinion. And I really would encourage people to do that. Where they listen to is another is another thing. Um, uh, I, I can't see anything changing drastically. Um, but if if it does change, I am sure there will be changes there that people will go, oh, isn't that very very positive and that's wonderful. But I can guarantee you that there will be. Um, and I'll speak about it. I'm sure before the end of the night, I believe there will be a very quite a sinister um, element to it that people might not recognise. Absolutely. And, you know, I suppose you mentioned parents there, Barra, and it's something which has become very evident. I know many parents myself who they're literally at the end of their tether in terms of, you know, fighting with the schools, principals, boards of management and essentially the state regarding how their their children are actually raised. And I suppose I know now you're a primary school teacher. There wouldn't be, you know, overtly an amount of uh, kind of toxic ideology being taught. Certainly, I hope not at this point anyway, but that definitely seems to be coming more infested into third level and secondary level education. But many parents, they're just so utterly disillusioned with the system that they've been kind of forced to um, take their children out of school, even though sometimes in many cases it's actually very difficult from a you know, teacher because they might require two incomes in the home. Like, is that quite understandable to yourself as to why parents have had to resort to such drastic measures when they've actually, you know, you've seen, I suppose, this, for want of a better term, type of communist ideology in which it's the, the destruction of the nucleus of the family unit and the state. Say as to how children are raised rather than the actual parents themselves. And that's, you know, that's enshrined in the Constitution that the parents are the foremost authority over their children's lives. And that's not what's happening in reality at the moment. Yeah, no, I, I agree wholeheartedly there now um, when it comes to like people are pulling their children out of um, out of school. So um, I, I thought I would ask people about this because I do know a few people who are homeschooling. You hear me OK there, John? Yeah, work away, Bar. Um, I've asked people this because I think it's I, I'd like to get their opinion of it and put it up here tonight and, and, and talk about it and let people hear. And I, I'm going to read out some of the, the, the things that people sent to send to me if that's okay and okay. what they all of all the, all the things he said is actually it's gas it's everything we've we've been discussing tonight and everything that we've brought up and um, so I'll, I'll just give you a quick flavor of some of the things people said right so a lot of it started from um uh, covid okay so people were um worried about you know child protection essentially so masks um hand sanitizers, pods, you know, that can't talk with their friends or play with their friends properly, you know, to protect children from the fear culture, essentially, that's been um, manifested in our schools. Um, they said they didn't, I'm going to list without some of them here, if I can read them out, uh, children being encouraged extrinsically, like through awards, instead of giving, I suppose, that love of, of learning um, and being truly happy and fulfilled you know so an in intrinsic rewards more so and um, again not focusing on children in, in children's interests there's no self-directed learning so let a child find out what they'd like to learn about and go for it and help them themselves here's a quote that says the education system was designed to condition and to fit into societal narrative it's an actual quote from parents um they, they also did the social element they weren't worried about because they actually connect with other homeschoolers other children being homeschooled so they're out about with them as well which is wonderful and because the fact that there's so many people being homeschool are homeschooling now there's plenty of opportunities to meet up with other homeschoolers and um, it's had too much reliance on screens and technology by teachers which i'll get onto at some stage and uh, not enough free movement you know so children stuck in chairs and sitting in chairs too much homework uh, too many woke agendas, such as the climate change and the and they mentioned the new sex ed uh, curriculum as well. Too much focus on academic subjects, which you just mentioned about. It's all focused towards um, maths and English. Um, I, I thought this was a wonderful. Somebody mentioned asking permission to go to the toilet because every time a child comes into my class for the first time, you know, so I'm teaching on the first day. I have this particular class. You know, they, they're there with their hand up, and I thought they might have a question. I said, they say, Can I go to Tyres or will Catagum, Dulgajin letters? I go, and I'm sort of caught off guard for a second because I don't get children to ask me permission to go to the toilet. I want them to go on their own. You don't ask permission to go to the toilet. Um, 
another one here what they mentioned which again brings us back to whole Patrick Pierce and our history and culture so the disconnect with our, our traditions um, heritage and, and nature so they feel that there's a disconnect now with that so they take their children out freedom from the rat race that was a quote you use and you eventually end up having a, a beautiful relationship with your with your children essentially and being at home with them um, school systems out of date and fear driven somebody else said it it's, it's it kills creativity we mentioned that there about um, Robinson he actually has a TED talk entitled our schools killing creativity um, saying what, what I found quite unusual was well, not unusual but quite worrying concerning was a few people mentioned me about a safe environment they want their children to be a safe environment which implies that they don't find schools a safe environment for their children and particularly nowadays I suppose with COVID and that fear culture and the fear of somebody coming in and maybe vaccinating your child without your consent and and you know people might think that's that's not going to happen but you know it, it has happened in other countries so it can potentially happen, happen here and they mentioned again lack of cure it's or it doesn't serve a child's curiosity there's no another freedom again to ch of choosing what to learn there's a lovely quote here so the past two years you've shown that our educators and are blindly and unquestioningly obedient to the dictates of the department and uh, government and which you know i have to agree with wholeheartedly because schools have have schools have really really let down children um this past year and a half teachers i'm not saying all teachers but a lot of teachers have really let them down principals really let children down boards of management have really let children down we have a, a shocking history in this country of letting children down and we haven't learned from our history we're continuing to do it now and that's what upsets and hurts me the most and that's what's made me speak out is about we're not minding our kids we're certainly not we're not protecting them so based on all of that of course people are going to take their kids out of the mainstream education system why wouldn't they it's a nice note to end on but let me just briefly say something as well i'd like to know and i think people should start to question this how is homeschooling falling under the responsibility or under the remit of a child welfare agency, i.e. Tuesday. I'd love, I'd love an answer to that. Why is homeschooling coming under uh, the remit of a child welfare agency? What's that implying about homeschooling and about parents who choose to educate their children at home? It, it, it kind of creates that, this almost suspicious narrative, doesn't it? It creates this suspicious narrative as though the uh, parents require an actual agency, which let's call a spade a spade, doesn't have a fantastic track record with regard to a lot of what has come before. Um, and a lot of parents have a lot of significant grievances with too, so that's, you know, that's well documented. And that they have the audacity almost to question how a family or parents choose to raise their children. It's really indicative of kind of where we are as a society. Yeah, I, I just, I, I, I can't believe it. It's just, it only really hit home a few months ago. Just thinking about that, that, uh, and it's, it's creating that, as you say, suspicion that there's something wrong with taking your child out of mainstream education. And I believe it's done purposely, John. I do, I do believe it was, it was a deliberate move to have them take over. Certainly, yeah, definitely. Absolutely, you know, there's, and uh, that's well documented. And you know, I suppose with homeschooling and the same as yourself, Barry, like I've. You know, I know a lot of people who've taken their kids out of school and, you know, I'd echo a lot of the shared a lot of the sentiments that you've since shared. And there is, I suppose, you know, with every cloud, there are silver linings. And one of the big silver linings over the course of the last years is those parents who have taken their children out of school. They found that there is actually quite large and well kind of established homeschooling networks. Children are being taught on a level which suits their own personal needs, bringing it back to the individuality. They're learning pragmatic and practical skills like, you know, foraging and woodwork and how to, you know, fix cars things that they can derive whatever it is kind of income that they might need when they're at an older age. And from what I've seen, I've met a lot of children who are actually homeschooled. They really actually seem to have a lot of intrinsic internal kind of satisfaction, which at the end of the day, that's what the education of a child is meant to be about primarily, really. Yeah, I hope um, I actually spoke to the children in my class about this, you know, 
if they were minister of education what would they change about education i got to write all this down i know my big pair by the way I'm, I'm, uh, you can hear me okay though can you yeah there's just a little bit of a lag there barra but i think it's coming i think it's okay now as long as you can hear me that's that, that's the main thing uh, um but i asked the children one of some of the you know the practical skill sets and life skills that uh you know, well, that's what I was hoping to hear from them. So I asked him for a minister of education, how could, how would you change the education system? Anything. And, you know, in a mature, I have, I have six class, so, you know, we don't want to, like, build a water park out in the yard. We're not talking about things like that. Um, but two of the things they actually mentioned was, uh, most people mentioned was how to cook and was how to make and build things, which I thought was absolutely just, you know, it was great to hear. Um, I, I didn't think it was anything surprising. It's, it's what I believe myself. Children should be taught how to cook in primary school and how to build and make things. And it's something I've been trying to introduce into, into the school, actually, is um, woodwork. So I've started doing work with kids. And, like we're currently now just planning on building a set of goalposts, transportable goalposts for the kids they can bring out every day good solid wooden ones and get the children to make them themselves. But even Pierce mentioned in the in the murder machine, he mentioned that um, education should involve manual work, both indoor and outdoor. He said, would I hope be part of the program of every school? Um, so again, 110 years ago, they're telling us to do this. And uh, you still don't really see it. Okay, again, the secondary school it becomes a subject. But again, it becomes a subject that you're marked on. It's a subject that you'll be assessed on at the end of X amount of years. Um, it'll be a subject, the, the assessment of this subject will then add to your total of, of your other assessments, which will determine where you go um, to college when you're finished your leaving cert. So again, it's all this assessment, assessment, assessment. Finland, for example, don't have standardised assessments. Now, I'm sure they have something in secondary school, but no standardised assessments. And they're still performing, outperforming most countries around the world. Um, I believe, again, some of the things we need to change, you've already mentioned critical thinking skills. It needs to be an absolute proper program of critical thinking skills. Um, growing food, eating healthy, particularly nowadays. We, we, we know now that, you know, we're being attacked from all sides now. We're being attacked from the sky. We're being attacked through our, our sinks, our taps. Mm -hmm. We're being attacked from the ground up, you know. So certainly there's a place for growing food and healthy eating now. And uh, I'd like to hear the kids on about cooking and making things. And that's what that's what interesting. And they believe their skills that they can bring with them through life. Why on the curriculum? Absolutely. And, you know, I think a lot of what we've touched upon so far, Barra, um, and I, I mentioned this uh, gentleman to you, it actually was a homeschooler who sent me a clip by the name of John Taylor Gatto. And uh, you said a man who's very much been spot on. So for I suppose for the people who don't uh, know who John Taylor got to, and I just found a little bit online, he's a former revered teacher who was a vocal advocate for homeschooling and unschooling. And he described the state's mechanism of schooling to be a method of destroying the family unit via infiltration of the minds of their children out of sight of their parents. I suppose, and from my own perspective, like this appears to have manifested in a greater disconnect between parents and children. So, like, to what extent would you attribute blame towards the education system for an absolute abomination, you know, in terms of really uh, breaking down that relationship? Because we know how sacrosanct and paramount that relationship between a parent and a child, even, you know, even more, I would, I would dare to say, than even a teacher. But that the fact that the if the education system is being utilized in such an insidious way to actually, you know, kind of create a broader disconnect between children and their parents, like to what extent would, does the education system have to hold up its hands and say, you know, we're really at fault here. And I don't mean individual teachers or principals or boards of management, but I mean the system as a whole. It's a very good question, actually. Um, I'll give you one simple one. I tell you, a disconnect between parents and, and children is homework. Uh, the amount of rows it costs when children, children come home. So that's certainly a, a disconnect between them. Um, I, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a hard one to answer, John. I think, I suppose I never really thought about that one. Um, I listened to what you, that, that um, John got as you said, that you sent to me, and I found that very, very interesting, um, what he said. Um, but 
we aren't addressing what the constitution says that you know we are the primary educators of these children and if we are primary educators of their children then we should be having more of a say in what they're learning um, now schools are meant to um, to uh, address parents and, and consult with parents on this and that but again it doesn't really happen it's or they might send out a quick survey and ask it's very tough questions. initially but I don't yeah, sorry. It's it's just often very. You find it's kind of sometimes quite sorry, a. Sorry, sorry, again. Sorry, bro. There's a lag. It's often like a tokenistic measure, you know, just oh, to sorry. tease them. Yeah. yeah, token. I mean, tokenism is one of the words I feel is is it, it's a that would associate with education most. It's full of tokenism. It's full of um, um, you know, box ticking. Absolutely. Um. So certainly, I think parents should have a much greater say. In what the children are uh, are, are teaching, um, you know, Article forty one point one point one again, you know that you know that the family is above all other human statutes, and people need now as well. I know I, I don't want to go off too much on it, but it's again reasserting their sovereignty. I've just realised all this now, and I've started to look into a lot more reasserting my sovereignty and trying to help parents reassert their sovereignty and ask questions and push back and ask the right questions and hold people accountable. And to show them that actually you're entitled to that, you're in charge, you're the master of your household, that nobody tells you what to do with your child in school, within reason, of course. But the third, what I'm, I'm specifically referring to is, you know, um, you know, masking your child, for example. Um, and it's trying to empower those people again, give them solutions. OK, and we need to take back that sovereignty. And people, parents, if you're listening, you need to understand that. A lot of these people think they're in charge and can tell you what to do. They actually can't. And when you actually challenge them on it and ask them to show proof of that, they can't. And it's as simple as that. So um, I, I take what you're, I, what you're saying, John, certainly. Um, and it's something I it's jumped out at me there now. Um, I, I would certainly concur with what, what you've said. And something I must look into a little bit more. Yeah, I suppose it's just, you know, people, uh, same as myself, you know, I'm learning day by day, like, and I, I, I'm glad the fact, Barry, that, you know, the emphasis being upon sovereignty and that, you know, pushing, because it does seem to be the theme that's coming across or all around the world um, with this kind of, you know, I suppose, yeah. great cataclysm in which we're in. Um, I just want to, if you don't mind, I want to read this out for the reader. It's yeah. a couple of six key functions that I found from John Taylor Gatto and how he described the, the six actual key functions of an education system. Yeah. Now, bearing in mind this isn't very, uh, shall we say, complementary towards the education system as a whole, not towards individual teachers, but just if you, you know, I'm not being deliberately antagonistic, but he said one of the first core function is adjustive to establish fixed habits of reaction to authority, following orders no matter how arbitrary and nonsensical, which is obviously very relevant to the day. Number two, he said diagnostic, to determine each student's proper social role, logging records on a cumulative mathematical basis. Number three, sorting, training individuals only so far as their likely destination in the social machine uh, will require and no further. Number four, conformity, stripping away the individuality and that which sets children apart in order to make their behavior predictable. Number five, hygienic, a process of natural selection, weeding out those the system deems to be terminally inferior. And number six, which I believe is a Latin word, propiedutic, um, which is a creating a small fraction of children who are quietly trained how to take <laughs> management of this current system at the behest of the system rulers. Now, I know there's probably a lot to digest and absorb there, both for yourself and the readers, but it does seem to kind of, I suppose, validate a lot of Padre Pierce's murder machine adjudication, you know, in terms of the, the state of the system and it being almost like a dead entity and it needs an infusion of character and of life and of soul. Like, what do you foresee to be paramount in trying to upend what many might construe as quite a callous system which is very firmly established in modern day Ireland? Long question, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, right, so going forward, in other words, is it? Essentially. Yeah. Um, well, two words that jumped out me there that you mentioned was uh, certainly conformity, <coughs> excuse me, and individuality, because um, we mentioned them already, they've come up. And you can see the general theme coming out here, John, in our conversation, what, what 
Spears has said, what Ken Robinson said, what the homeschooling parents have said, and what uh, that gentleman, uh, John Grotto, is that what you said his name was? Uh, John Taylor Grotto, yeah. Yeah. So you can see the, the, the general trend there and the theme going on. Um, so again, it all comes back to that. Like, I mean, I believe that we need, and I think I've mentioned this already, we need to devolve responsibility for learning um, to schools, I believe. You know, you know that they're given freedom and, and, and autonomy uh, for, for educating. Um, I, I think I wrote something down here. Pierce said, he goes, there's no freedom in Irish education. No freedom for the child. No freedom for the teacher. No freedom for the school. Again, this is 110 years ago. 110 years ago. Nothing's changed. Okay? And if nothing's changed in that amount of time, does that not tell you that it's probably because they don't want it to change. That's what it tells me. Anyway, um, but, you know, we have, like, the government and I'd say their global partners, you know, they decide that, that they know best and that, you know, they'll tell us what we, what we should be doing. Um, education does not go on in the meeting rooms of Leinster House, okay? It goes on in classrooms. And the sooner they realise that, the better. So if you remove autonomy from um, schools, teachers, and students, for that for that matter, I, I believe it's all pointless then. It's just pointless. Um, like schools are given, um, they are given the, uh, the, the, the autonomy to do what's called school self-evaluation. We're able to self-evaluate. Um, and that might sound wonderful. Oh, you know, self-evaluate yourself and come up and, and come up and improve on plans and things like that. But it's, it's an evaluation based on what someone else has told us what is important. Okay, so it's essentially autonomy within a, an accountable realm or autonomy within an accountable parameters. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a bit of an oxymoron, uh, re, uh, really, you know what I mean? So I'd like to see more autonomy given to schools. I am um, a good friend of mine, um, a dear friend of mine was recently promoted to principal um, of, a, of a secondary school. Um, and I hope he's not listening. Um, and one of the quotes he put out there when he's in the local newspaper was, he said, no school is an island. And, you know, think about it. It is a lovely quote. No school is an island. But for some reason, it led me to stop and go, no, I disagree. Um, if I was principal, I'd want my school to be an island. I think schools should be a series of islands, all independent of each other. Yes, of course, you can network and help each other think, uh, like that. But... but I think a lot of schools are networking with each other because of all these initiatives being thrown out all the time. And there's initiative after initiative after initiative, and nobody's looking what's behind those initiatives, where they're coming from. I'll give an example, even like the Green Schools Initiative. Everyone thinks well, it's a wonderful thing. Okay, let's you know, you know, let's protect the earth. Let's re, you know recycle. Blah 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 blah. But I mean, re-schools or the green schools, the word that's used all of the time, you'll hear mentioned is sustainability, sustainability, sustainability. That word is the darling word of the World Economic Forum. Sustainability, sustainability. And, and the UN challenge agenda, anyone else or UN Agenda 30. Percent. You go on to the um, World Economic Forum website now and count them out of times you see the word sustainable or sustainability in any of their initiatives so i'd be very skeptical now of that i believe now that you know they're trying to get children to the and it, it's basically a warm-up lesson now for the next thing that's going to come climate change okay we're sick of hearing about climate change i mean i've seen documents of, of warning about climate change back from the 40s and the 50s and it still hasn't happened yet so again people need to start you know copping on a little bit you know and Again, I'm not fully convinced yet, but I'm at least I'm doing my research now and I'm looking into it. And I'm sure there's some truth in it, but I'm sure there's a lot of bullshit, excuse my language, behind it as well. And they're getting into our schools that way doing that. Sustainability, sustainability, sustainability. That's getting into children's heads. And um, you know do you know what's one of the interesting things about that bar and like you know I, i'm very much along the same lines yourself with regarding climate change like it, it's the absence i suppose i find especially with younger people these days now i'm quite young myself in 28 but especially people who are coming through the last the social media age is the the level of almost anger towards the even concept of critical debate so for example you might find uh, granted i am generalizing but you might find your 
your standard kind of 16, 17, 18 year old, and you maybe, you know, not your standard, but many of which, and you might say, well, climate change, I actually believe that we've gone through a grand solar minimum. This has happened many times before. And it, it is the so-called elites or parasites, whatever way you want to call the people in the upper echelons of the world society, like the World Economic Forum, and that, that it's just another kind of ruse for them to gain more control in the world. And you'll be met with, you know, you mightn't phrase it like that, but you might tell them to look into things, but you'll be met with absolute kind of, you know, fervor and anger because that critical debate is just, it's being, it's not being, you know, fostered within schools again, or that, that willingness to speak to people who you disagree with, you know, I think that's becoming very self-evident on the basis of the, you know, the, the fallibilities or the lacking, things that are lacking within the education system. Yeah, and it's look, it's not going to change that um as you say, that response you're gonna get from people. I mean, why again? Because they're just being conditioned through uh through the media. So COVID is just one thing now, that'll be gone. We'd all have forgotten about that in the old time and it'll be on to the next thing. And again, if you, you I or anyone challenges that, we're gonna be met with the same resistance and the same vilification. Nothing's gonna change there. And that's why it's so important to, to really Teachers, you know, start getting your children to question things. Um, really asking questions all the time. You know, I know a lot of teachers don't like actually children asking questions. You know, and they discourage nearly questions sometimes. But I love children asking questions. Sometimes it can be irritating. But, but you know, I'd rather them ask than not. And we need to get them asking questions, trying to look behind you and stopping, stepping back and seeing what's behind this. And you can do it through lots of things. You can do it through story. You can do it by what watching. The kids knew it was even on, on, on YouTube or something like that. And just start questioning things. You know, obviously be very careful. Don't put your own opinion across, but try and get them thinking. It's so, so important because you mentioned that we've mentioned now the WEF, so I might as well going to mention about them here because um, have we got time there? Yeah, work away. Work away. Plenty of time. Yeah. yeah, work away. Because um, this is very, very important. And um, anyone who knows the, the Irish Education Alliance, with the, they might know that we've had awful grievances with the uh, the INTO, the Irish National Teachers Organization. Okay. Um now obviously other the secondary teachers as well, they'd have issues with their unions, but particularly with the Irish National Teachers Organization, because they are absolutely instrumental in masking our children in children in schools. Okay. Hickwa, this last year, three times were asked to do a risk benefit analysis on masking children. I don't want to go over all ground, but I have to give a little bit of a background to it. And three times they set an effort, no, not for kids in primary school. But all the time, all the while, INTO were pushing this and pushing this and pushing this. And Neffet knew this, and basically Neffet then next time didn't go near Hickwa, bypassed them and brought in masks for children. Now we in the education lines, we, we we challenge them on this and say, like we, none of us know of any teachers that were calling for this, right? We don't know of any teachers who are calling for this. I'm not saying there aren't teachers in the country who aren't calling for it. I'm sure there are um, a few um, bedwetters around the country who are calling for it. But anyway, um, we asked them for proof. Okay, show us. What's the proof that? How many paid teachers have asked for this out of your whole membership? Thousands of us. How many have asked for it? They wouldn't show us anything. I asked, well, could you show your longitudinal and latitudinal studies on um, your reasons for calling for this that prove that masks um, prevent the spread of COVID and will not damage children's health? Show us it. They wouldn't do it. They kept trying to fob us off, off telling us Neffet had it. We said, well, if Neffet have it, we've asked them. They, they, they don't have it or they're not working with us. If Neffet have them, they would surely have given one to you. OK, so I, I, I'll say this straight out. OK, the INTO are liars. They're liars. And we will be coming after them. We're not going to let them away with this. Uh, just, just to let people know that. So it got me thinking, who were they speaking for? Or who's controlling them? I mean, surely if they're, they're meant to represent me and my colleagues, they obviously weren't because none of us were calling for masks, and yet they were calling for it. So they obviously had masters somewhere. And I started to look into it and I was digging deep and trying to find out stuff. And thankfully, somebody just out of pure coincidence sent me some information. And it was the information I was actually looking for. It was marvelous. It saved me so much time. And what it was was a document uh, referring to this organization called Education International. And so what's Education International? Well, apparently, 
it's it's an organization a teachers union an international union that represents uh more than 32 million teachers in the in the world over 178 countries of which i'm apparently a member <laughs> now, I, I can't remember signing up for it but if you want to their website and you look in <coughs> excuse me um, it can break up all the countries and the INTO, the ASTI, the TOI, and there's another teachers union, I can't remember, are members of this education alliance. So I said, right, okay, right. Uh, so again, it's this global element that once you hear global or this international thing, you've got to start getting suspicious. You know, you really, it, it puts the willies up you. And so I looked into it more, and thankfully this document was sent to me that a lot of the research had been done by some Joe, I don't know who he was, whatever you did marvelous research so essentially education alliance is walking hand in hand it's tethered to the waf and unesco the united nations education scientific and cultural organization working hand in hand okay they're also parroting the the the, the bill and melinda gates foundation's uh reimagining education campaign okay so they go as soon as you hear gates i mean you know that the antichrist you know the devil incarnate on earth himself so what are they what are they really Reimagining, well, um, I just scribbled a few notes here. They're reimagining a new post human education system, okay? And they're, they're essentially pushing for ed tech, so education technology overhauls that, such as seeking to privatize public schools and to uh, through partnerships with big tech companies um, that will facilitate online distance learning. Um, now, have we seen that recently by any chance? Yes, we have. You remember the little disease, the killer disease called COVID, where we were all told we couldn't go to schools and we all ended up where? Online, okay, learning. Mm. So, you know, the, the evidence is in there at the moment. If you also look, it, it, it's, they've actually, um, it, it, it's mentioned as well. It's all geared towards essentially um, advancing the fourth industrial uh, revolution. So I'll just give you a little, um, so people might not be aware of what the uh, fourth industrial revolution is. Um, we've had obviously our first um, revolution, which was industrial revolution was water and steam. The second was technology. I think the third was digital. And now we've got this, it's the, the, the fourth industrial revolution, which is essentially the joining of technology such as artificial intelligence, gene editing. Where have we heard that recently? Mm. Okay gene therapy uh, to advance robo robotics and it's it, it's essentially the blurring of the lines between um, the physical the digital and the biological um uh, worlds okay so if you actually want to the w the wef now again i'm not going off on a tangent here this is still about unions but they're hand in hand with the wf here and we'll all tie it in here this is what the, the wef say about it and one thing i'll hand to the wf i have to credit them they don't hide things they're very honest Everything you want and all, all their plans is actually, you can find it on their website. Um, so they're, they're quite brazen about what they're going to do. And it's there for you to find out the, 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 uh, the Great Reset, uh, the Fourth Industrial Revolution. And I, I, I quote what it says on their website. It, the Fourth Industrial Revolution represents a fundamental change in the way we live, work and relate to one another. Okay, lovely. It's a new chapter in human development enabled by extraordinary technology advances commensurate with those of the first, second, and third industrial revolutions. So it's basically blending all of them together, but this time adding the biological. These advantages are merging the physical, the digital, and the biological worlds in ways that create both huge promise and potential peril. They're actually letting us know it could create potential peril. You know, you have to love their honesty. The speed, breadth, and depth of this revolution is forcing us to rethink how countries develop, how organizations create value and wait for it, and even what it means to be human. I mean, that's what the Education International, uh, the, the WF and UNESCO have in store for us. So, and if, if you just delve in even further, okay, their plan, their, their, their plan of course, as I said, is to, is to expand all these global, global ed tech systems for the purpose of creating new curricula, plural of curriculum, new curricula to meet uh, processing needs of, of future labor um, demands. So again, we're back to square one, producing little minions for economies, or as Piers put it, no cogs in the in, in the machine. Um, and if you look how it's actually happening now as well, you've got Google Classrooms now, 
Okay, you've got CISA, all these online, these global corporations. Okay, and I'll just briefly mention, okay, I could talk about this online, but I'm not going to. Okay, Education Alliance is working, or Education International is working with all of these people. Let's listen to some of their, listen to the terminology. Okay, so the Global Education First Initiative, the UN's World Declaration of Education for All, the Rethinking Education Toward a Global Common Good, uh, the Global Education Coalition, the International Bureau of Education, the Global Agenda Council on Education Systems, the Education Entrepreneurship Employment Nexus. I can't keep up with the, with, with the words here, Gl global, global, global. Who funds them? Rockefeller Foundation is involved. Where have we heard them? Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the Galton Institute, which used to be the British Eugenic Society, the Gold Goldman Sachs, Bain Capital, Soros Fund Management, Kissinger Associates, World Bank, the Carlyle Group, Blackstone Group, Visa, Mastercard, JP Morgan, Bank of America, HSBC Bank, Rothschild, Gambeha, where have you heard of them? Deutsche Bank. They're all involved there. Which technology companies are involved? Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Huawei, Intel, Cisco, Lenovo, Accenture, Dell, even the, um, um, the McGraw-Hill uh, um, education book publishers are getting involved. And they're all, it's all about bringing in AI, artificial intelligence, virtual reality and augmented reality into our schools. Um, that's what our unions are, are involved in, um, folks. And just to let people know, we're, we're going to be challenging uh, INTO on this, and we're going to seek their correspondence they have with this Education International. And it all made sense then why they were calling for masks, because they are part of the narrative. So their masters are obviously in the, the educational section of the World Economic Forum and UNESCO and the likes. It's unbelievable. It's quite harrowing, Barra, but I suppose it's it's not that surprising. And you literally listed out a who's who of, you know, globalist institutions that have, you know, an inordinate amount of influence over this yeah. world do not have the betterment of Irish children uh, at heart. That's quite categorically clear. So I'm delighted that you've been able to disseminate that awareness to all the listeners here. So it's something that people can be aware of. And, you know, you mentioned the Irish Education Alliance, and I suppose I just have to look credit where credit's true. Obviously, I've been very critical of the, the system, which a lot of people are, but there there does seem to be a quite a strong nucleus of unit. I believe you're over 200 members um, at present. Am I correct in saying that in the Irish Education Alliance? Um, and just with that in mind, so for any, you know, be it teachers, principals, boards of management. Yeah, they are. And, and Oh, sorry, I may have did my last connection there, but just for those, um, I'll just finish up on this point, Barron, and then I'll just um, I'll maybe close up and um, just to, I'll ask you this final question. But for those teachers, principals, boards of management who, you know, are conscientious object objectors to much of the indoctrination and the harm in which children, you know, are actually being put to the forefront of and the fact that their holistic well-being is you know really realistically as we've kind of learned over the course of the last hour or so it's not being uh you know it's not being cultivated it's not being nurtured i think that's the real word it's not actually being nurtured what kind of pragmatic advice might you give to some of those individuals be it you know teachers might be able to join the irish education alliance or those people within the system who you know maybe want to actually almost I, I dare I say it to see the system collapse because even if you look at the education system as one aspect of all the you know the institutions of the establishment, there would be a fairly prevailing kind of view or consensus that all the institutions ought to collapse during this kind of great cataclysm and when this great lie does invariably come out. Um, but what can people do who are within the system of the education that can make a difference for the future generations of our our precious and kind of um, you know I suppose susceptible young minds. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me again. Um first of all in terms of the Irish Asian lines, yeah, the wonderful people. Um that some of which are just in it just for support and for um to be with around like minded people. Others who want to be more active um meeting up socially, having debates and discussions, educating each other, helping each other. It, it's a marvellous group to be involved in. So um, if anyone is willing to join who, who haven't heard of it about this yet, and it, go, it goes out to all school staff, by the way. It's not just, you know, um, uh, teachers, you know, it can be it can be secretaries, SNAs. It's, it's, it's anyone who works in the school. It can, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not sure if we have anyone who joins specifically as a member of a board of management, um, but absolutely welcome. 
um, because they're part of the education uh, system and they're part of what's going on in, in, in these individual schools. So reach out. Uh, the best way is supposed to reach out. We can get you into our Telegram group, but reach out through the Facebook page, the Irish Education Alliance. Just go into it. You'll find it. Send a personal message and uh, we'll get you in. But what, what I will say as well is, John, a lot of this really has to come down to the individual as well. Um, and if you want to do something in your school and for the children in your school, you've got to really show courage. You're going to have to be brave and you're going to have to stand up for what's right and what's wrong. If you see something and know it's wrong, you've got to stand up. And we can give advice on that and how to go about it. And if we can't, we know who to go to get advice as well. So if, if I, I give advice all the time to people, I have teachers ringing me about uh, situations. And if it's something I don't know what to do, I'll go to somebody else because I know people who are more knowledgeable on the whole process or sovereignty or legal side of things. Um, and so you'll, you'll get great advice from us. Um, but it does come from you first, your courage. Speak out. There's too many people are not speaking out. And people don't like being called. I know deep down that most principals most principals know what they're doing is wrong, but they don't want to push back against the system. Most teachers know what they're doing is wrong if they're enforcing masks. You know, I know most schools probably, I'd hopefully think most schools aren't enforcing it as in pull that up, put that back on. You're not going out on a, on a, a mask break because you're messing or whatever. I don't believe the majority are doing that, but I'd like to think anyway. Um, but still, you're not speaking out. And you need to, because even if you're not enforcing it or being too strict on it, there's still children coming to school with masks on them because they feel they get into trouble if they don't. And they're being sent in by parents because they think they might be turned away from education if they don't. That can't happen. It won't happen. Don't worry. Um, so you need courage and you need to speak out and reach out as well. Um, and rattle the cages. So what? Nobody likes conflict. I don't like conflict, but I mean, I've had my fair share of conflict this year with, with uh, boards, with you know principals, and so be it. That's the way it goes. Um, you get used to it. Um, so you do really do need courage. But obviously, join the Irish Education Alliance. We look after you. We give you a lot of support and, uh, and advice. And um, please, people, speak out. Speak out. Excellent stuff, Barra. Uh, that's brilliant. And I hope that there is many different teachers and stuff who are probably, you know, kind of hammering around the edges and having questions that that will act as a source of encouragement for them to do so. So, look, I'd like to thank you very much for your time this evening, Barra. Uh, I'm sure we'll speak to you again. We'll do a round three uh, at some point in Can the finish with a quote, John? You can, of course, and then I have one point to make, just a special mention to, uh, actually, just, no, i leave you finish if I just make, make reference to, no, and then i leave you to have the final word, Barra. So I just want to make make people aware, uh, give special mention to Ashling Foy uh, and Kaylee Foy. We did an interview there just prior to Christmas. I believe Kaylee, she's a 14-year-old girl in school in, I believe, in, I think it's Bundoran in Donegal. Um, and she's been denied her constitutional right to education since the 9th of December of last year. And it was actually attending one of the protests that you actually spoke at, sorry, assemblies, uh, public assemblies that you spoke at, Barra, that uh, she was actually inspired to take off the mask. And since she's actually been denied her education, and I've just I read this morning from the uh, Lawyers for Justice page, Facebook page, that her mother, Ashling, a very brave woman who's actually uh, willing to take this case all the way to the High Court, if necessary because her child is being denied her access to education so I think that's the kind of bravery that's uh, and courage that you're speaking of Barra so with that in mind by all means please take it away yeah and very quickly I, I watch your, your your program with the with the two ladies um and I have to say just as you said just brave brave people and well done and fair play to them. I don't know that um uh, the young girl but you know don't know her at all I actually feel pride um knowing that she's part of, she, that, that she came to one of our events and um, I'm proud of her for doing that. And I don't even know her. I just think it's marvellous. And lots of children have, have come up to us at further peaceful assemblies and told us with their parents that they've actually taken off masks now because they listened to a few of us in the Irish Education Alliance. And that's just wonderful. But if you with this, just from the man himself, um, just, I suppose, summing up what the education system should be, It'll take about 30 seconds or so. So I'll leave you with this. And thanks again, John, for having me on. Uh, the first thing I plead for is freedom. Freedom for each school 
school to shape its own program in conformity with the circumstances of the school. That's the place, the size, the personnel. Freedom again for the individual teacher to impart something of his own personality to his work, to bring his own peculiar gifts to the service of his pupils, to be, in short, a teacher, a master, one having an intimate and permanent relationship with his pupils, and not a mere part of the educational machine, a mere cog in the wheel. And finally, for the individual pupil and scope for his development within the school and within the system, and I would promote this idea of freedom by the very organisation of the school itself, giving a greater certain autonomy, not only to the school, but to the particular parts of the school, to the staff, of course, but also to the pupils. Sums up our conversation, I think. Lovely, John. Great it does advice. indeed. It encapsulates nicely. So good night and God bless, guys. And we'll see you for Double Down on Thursday of next week again. Thank you very much.